welcome everyone to AFRICAM for Good, brought to you by explore.org. And uh, thank you for joining us today for a lovely show that we've got chatting to the venerable James Henry, of course, many of you will know. And today we're going to be discussing a look back essentially at 2021. Um, we'll go into some detail and conversation about uh, what it's been like uh, working in the bush as a private guide uh, with travel bans and all the other issues that we've had as an industry for the past year. We'll also touch on a couple of conservation stories that we've enjoyed um, and that we think have been you know, really positive that we've, that we've seen throughout the year. And then lastly, of course, um, we'll go into some of the highlights of our favorite things that we've captured on the cameras here at AFRICAM uh, in the last year or so. So that's really the plan for the day. And um, James, thank you for joining us. How's it going? Thank you very much for having me. Um, <laughs> it's going fine. The year is drawing to a close, as it always seems to do about three minutes after it starts. And <laughs> yeah, I think there's been some interesting conservation highlights. Obviously, a landscape dominated by COVID once again, unfortunately, but there have been some positives, uh, some negatives, and yeah, it'd be interesting to chat through what those were for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, we'll have pretty much just a discussion today and see what our thoughts are on all of these things. And the first thing, you know, that I mentioned that I'd, I'd like to chat to you about and, and, you know, get your feeling from yourself, from your colleagues out there in the field, um, you know, working as a private guide, a safari guide uh, in the field. How has guiding guests been this year with the various travel bans, uh, COVID, etc.? cetera? Uh, and what are your hopes for, for next year in 2022? Well, I did two big trips this year. Well, I mean, I did four trips, two of them quite large trips, and one of them that went off to, well, same show, I suppose, uh, within Africa, to Kenya. And what I found was, you know, I mean, we went in August, so, you know, a good year and a bit after the first travel bans were instituted. And I think that the lodges and places that we went had really adapted quite well and obviously that had a horrific time leading up to around about when we went um, but things were opening up and you know they were dealing with COVID tests it was very easy to be tested in the lodge for your international PCR test that you needed you know all the staff were masked up when they needed to be they were sensitive to everything there was hand sanitizer everywhere and I think they've adapted as they've had to uh, pretty well. Uh, that was in Kenya and in South Africa, I think same kind of thing. I think there are a lot of uh, laboratories around the place that have made a huge amount of money uh, doing these tests. I don't believe they cost anything like what they're charging us to have ourselves tested. I mean, I think I've had 10 or 12 tests since the advent of COVID and at 850 Rand a pop, which is what, about $50 a pop, which I think is pretty cheap uh, for the, as far as the world's concerned, you know, that's still a substantial amount of money that I've paid over to various laboratories. Anyway, that aside, I think that tourism is managing to handle it pretty well. And I hope going forward, obviously, um, look, you can look at the latest travel ban from the UK and the European Union, which has subsequently been lifted, thankfully. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it was moronic in to say the least as a polite way of putting it um, and unfortunately that damage has been done you know they've, they've damaged our december january tourism uh, possibly into the early parts of next year uh, it certainly affected my ability to travel i was going to go overseas and do a bit of a road show in the us um, that's now been cancelled um, you know, maybe now I'll try and do it again. But what I think, the reason I'm talking about this, what I think is going to happen is that I really think that tourism is becoming so much more adaptable. I think tourists are becoming so much more adaptable. And I think they're making plans around these things. So, you know, I, you know, and government's even becoming a little bit more adaptable. So what would have taken four months of deliberations of subcommittees of subcommittees, you know, it took them, what, it took the UK a couple of days once they decided to lift it, to lift the ban. Um, you know, so I think we're becoming a lot more adaptable from all sides. And I think that 
I'm hoping that by the end of next year, by the end of 2022, these things will just be part of what we do. Um, yeah, you, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to travel for a week, but don't worry, it will only be a week long kind of thing. And I think we'll understand mm -hmm. things a lot better. And I think the effects on people like you and I, who have trips booked and are hoping desperately that they won't be cancelled because of uh, the travel bans, I think that people like you and I will, um, I think come 12 months time, we'll be able to operate pretty normally. What do you think? Yeah, look, I think we're very much on the same page, you know, having chatted to also other colleagues out there in the in the field from all various countries and, and even, um, you know, overseas guiding in North America and Australia, etc. Obviously, each place has got their major challenges. But here in Africa, you know what I found too. the last one I hosted was a nice big one in, in end of July. And um, you know, that was a group of 14 people from the US. Um, and, you know, we, we had an amazing time, you know, as you say, that the lodges were absolutely geared up for all the testing that was required. We had, um, you know, they facilitated a helicopter to meet us out on game drive for our, our COVID yeah. tests, which was quite luxurious, easily the best COVID tests I've ever done, even though, as you say, you do enough to, you know, feel like you've got a permanent phlegm and grimace going on because of that, yes. that lovely thing up your nose um but to be fair i feel like you know as you say lodges the industry as a whole airlines um and then slowly governments you know i think they've really started to come to terms with what you know a lot of people are calling the new the new norm of of travel um i think again you know for, for you and i we've seen over the years, you know, you've had to get uh, yellow fever vaccinations, um, people yeah. on various prophylactics for malaria, um, you know, that people have, have done quite happily um, in, in wanting to visit Africa or areas that require those kinds of tests. So I think this might just be another one of those and, and, uh, and something that we have to just start, start dealing with. Um, for, for 2022, yeah, things look good. You know, the guests of mine that I've spoken to who have booked for next year um, and uh, various suppliers that I work with, uh, things look good, as I know um, they do for you too. The people are, are keen to come. They, they're ready to travel. They're happy to do what needs to be done, jump through whatever hoops are put in front of them and, uh, and come on safari. Because as we know, once you're here, you know the, the nature of safari essentially puts you uh, you know, no, not much better place for social distancing than out in the field um, in the wildest parts of Africa. So, yeah, I, I'm actually very confident for the year. As you say, things can and will happen. We may see more variants and what those impacts are on us. We don't know. But as you say, I think people are people, governments uh, and all the role players in travel in Africa have become more flexible, like you said. So I'm totally with you. I think I think we've got a lot to be positive for for 2022. Well, it can't be much worse than 2020 or 2021. No, so, <laughs> no, it be. I think what's quite interesting also is that the you know, I've, a lot of our tourists are American. They're a massively massively important market to Africa. Um, they contribute a huge amount of income to tourism operations and conservation operations in Africa. And I think what was great is that this, with this latest train smash, um, the U.S. seemed to have a much more cold towel around the head reaction to mm. it. And I thought that was really encouraging. You know, they're, I mean, obviously Europe is a massive market as well, but the U.S. is probably our most important market. And I think everyone tends to take their cues from the U.S. They tended to react and to this Omicron disaster in a much more rational manner. Um, yeah. And I think, thankfully, I, I suspect that Europe and Canada um, have taken less time to overcome their paranoia uh, on mm. as a result of the US. And I mean, that's not something of late that we've been able to say, but I think <laughs> the US really has has led the way on, on, on the reaction. Yeah, I agree. Uh, as I said, having spoken to some clients looking to travel early next year and guests that are coming through, 
they don't seem too deterred by the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, everyone's keeping an eye on on it, and you know, you always want to get the best information you can. But I, I feel most people are feeling pretty confident about travel to Africa next year. So let's hope that continues. Absolutely. All right. Well, moving on from the travel side of things and, and uh, moving away from COVID for now, what has been one of your conservation stories from 2021 that has stuck out to you, James? Well, we've just recently had word from the Giraffe Conservation Fund, which is a, a large NGO, well, it's not a very large NGO, but it does large work on <laughs> giraffe conservation. And they do a lot of stuff around uh, species um, designation. You know, there are four species of giraffe now they've decided and various different subspecies of each. But what's interesting is that word has just come out that all of those subspecies have shown an increase in the last year, which I think is massively important. Now, that's not necessarily because the populations are increasing everywhere. Uh, it's often got to do with a better counting methods, but mm -hmm. giraffes, which, you know, a year or two ago, we were thinking, gee whiz, you know, we're on the verge of an extinction event here, actually seem to be making a bit of a comeback. So that giraffe story is a very positive one in a uh, newscape that is often fairly sort of suicidal uh, from a conservation point of view. And uh, I hope that next year we'll bring more of the same kind of thing. I mean, we're obviously awash in stories of rivers being dammed up. I know that there are two proposed for the Zambezi in the next year. The west coast of South Africa being mined, deforestation everywhere you like. Um, but that giraffe story was a positive one. Yeah, look, it's it's so nice to hear positive things. I, we actually had a lovely chat with the guys at the conservation uh, giraffe conservation fund, um, and uh, you know they gave us some interesting insights. Like you said, you know, from species point of view, and but again, you know, from all the people that I've chatted to this year um, that have joined us on this show. Um, the, the, the big positive that I took out of that was kind of a more general one in terms of uh, conservation for this year. And it is, you know, something that's pretty close to my heart from the moment I started guiding companies that I worked with. Uh, they were all, you know, keen on involving community. And, um, you know, I think early on in conservation circles, perhaps in the, from the 1980s, 1990s, particularly South Africa, there wasn't a lot of involvement in community. You know, it was basically get out the way and we will continue to do what we think is the right solution for conservation. And in some cases that worked from an animal point of view, but certainly not from a social point of view. And I think put a bad taste in the mouths of many communities around, uh, around those conservation areas, you know, from yeah. um, wild wild areas in, in KwaZulu-Natal through to areas around Kruger National Park. For me, the pattern that I've seen this year is all the success stories, uh, the positives coming out of these conservation groups has been really positive involvement with that community. Um, from uh, simple things like uh, engagement with, uh, with cattle farmers around, around reserves when it comes to predators and predation, uh, and losing cattle to to predators, um, to to things like uh, involving the community directly from an education point of view. That the you know the bush babies um, who we had a chat with not long ago, um, with children and the elderly community combining to to help grow understanding of why conservation is important um, in Africa. Because, like I said, I feel in in many cases those communities were so sidelined that they really saw no real value, that it was almost um, properties, lands, uh, and their own territory that was being taken away um, for you know, wealth somewhere else. And they weren't seeing any real yeah. direct rewards from that. So I have to say a lot of positive stories that have come out of conservation in that regard, which, which seems to be, um, the only way to go, in my opinion, in, in making these conservation stories a success. Yeah, you know, I mean, back in the, in the late 80s, 
this first concept, this concept of communities and conservation began to rear its head. And I remember doing, when I was doing my first undergraduate degree, um, you know, that was, the, that was the new buzzword, communities and conservation. And I think you're right though, it's taken a very long time for it to be mainstreamed. There's been a huge amount of uh, talk about it and very little actual effort being made. And I think that you're, you're right. I think communities have found voices. I think they've now loud enough that people in conservation realize that without those voices being heard, there is no conservation. And I think finally that's actually starting to happen. And I, yeah, I think that's a, you're right. It's a tremendously positive thing. Um, uh, the, that classic quote from the Utah community, not in Salt Lake City, uh, but outside of um, outside of the Sabi Sands, the chief mm -hmm. made a comment in the community meeting once, um, that you know these a big NGO came in to talk about rhino poaching. What you know, what are we going to do about rhino poaching? And the chief stood up and he said, you know, something along the lines of, you know they you took these rhino away from us they used to be ours and now you come in here you're losing them and now you're saying that they're ours and we must help you protect them you know <laughs> a bit of a disconnect there what are you yeah. talking about yeah. and i thought that was very powerful but that voice is now being heard those voices are being heard and that's that is where the rubber meets the road as far as conservation goes those rural areas outside protected areas are where conservation will either fail or succeed. So I think another big positive from conservation is something like the Herding for Health program, which is run by the Peace Parks. And, you know, a lot of people think of cattle and livestock as being anathema to conservation. These mm -hmm. guys have come together, put together a hugely innovative, adaptable program that engages communities and livestock owners around reserves, helps them with grazing regimes, uses traditional herding methods, and just kind of helps to not reduce cattle numbers, but graze them in such a way that the rangelands maintain their health, uh, hopefully provides them with access to markets for these livestock, which are often difficult for rural people to access. And, you know, stories like that really are indicative of an understanding that rural people cannot be excluded from conservation. And I mean, I think intellectually, we've known that for a long time. I think finally, mm. as you say, it's starting to be mainstreamed and you know, it's very difficult to find anybody interested in conservation right now who doesn't realize that. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the leaders and uh, you know, directors, founders of all these various NGOs, conservation groups, and of course the you know, various players in the travel industry, it's no longer just a PR, you know, um, yeah. idea. It's, it's really, I think people have really seen the success of true yeah. community engagement. So yeah, let's hope that that continues. And um, yeah, thanks for your insights there, James. Okay, and finally, I think we got to dive into, you know, what we're all about here at Africa. I mean, and that's of course, what we've seen on the cameras. And, you know, I think, we got to ask what for you has been one of your favorite moments or even a couple of your favorite moments, James, that we've captured on the cameras this year and why? Just quickly. I mean, I think it's amazing what these cam cameras do capture because no one can be out there all the time observing. And I mean, you and I have been guiding around for a long time and yet we still see new stuff on these cameras all the time because we you know we're just not out there all the time. And I think for me, there were two major highlights. One was the Pell's fishing owl fledgling that seemed to be playing on the banks of the Olifants <laughs> River, a bit like uh, I remember doing as a kid on the banks of some of these coastal rivers, you know, jumping on the bank and trying to make it collapse. Um, I didn't fly quite as well as this Pell's owl did, but you know, it's a very rare owl, but it really did seem to be entertaining itself. The, really is difficult to find another explanation for what it was doing. Yeah. So that was one of my major highlights. And I think the second one was the interaction between the leopard tortoise and the crocodile, again, yeah. at a waterhole. Um, and 
you know, if you haven't seen it, obviously we'll show it to you now, but the tortoise comes down, crocodile sees the tortoise coming, thinks, oh, here we go, and goes for the tortoise, which does the tortoise thing and goes back into its shell. But what astounded me then is that once this incredibly slow interaction had broken up, the tortoise came back again. I think it was a day later. And there was yeah. the crocodile sitting right next to the tortoise. And the two of them just seemed to be considering each other's reptilian lives uh, without apparent animosity. But it was just bizarre and something that you wouldn't normally capture on safari. And I think that was, uh, those were my two big highlights from the cameras. Yeah, awesome. I, I loved those sightings as well and, and could easily have been some of my favorites. Like you say, you know, for, for, for guides like us who've spent so much time in the field, uh, seeing these rare and interesting behaviors is definitely some of the, the coolest things about the camera. I, I have to say one of my favorites this year, something I've never seen on safari uh, in the field, and that was porcupine mating. You know, I, I've never yes. actually seen that happen before. Um, because you, you know, there's a million safari jokes about it, and we, all, you know, safari guides use the same old jokes all the time. That's what we do best, and uh, it was nice to actually see that happen for once and, and watch watch that behavior go down. And then another one, which was actually fairly recently, which just made me laugh out loud. It is something I've seen before, but I just thought it was just an amazing example of how how tough it is out there in the field. And that was um, the beautiful Watika our female leopard a young female leopard that was having a drink at the waterhole something made a noise in the bush behind her and she got the fright of her life jumped up and in midair you know just like cats can do twisting around and turning her body to you know see what what on earth had 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 made that sound and it turned out to be nothing but we didn't actually figure out what it was but she carried on drinking nonetheless but i just thought it was a you know a nice example of of how tough life is for you know for leopard out there i had a little thought as well that it was like uh, we're moving away from uh, worrying about covid and then oh no there's omicron that's that's basically how she was reacting to that as well but for me the life of leopards you know so often considered these magically secretive animals um these devastating predators um and that they're so powerful and majestic, but at the same time, they've got so much to worry about, you know, from other big predators um, that may, may be in the area and, uh, and their life is, is just as difficult as all the other species out there. And I, I just, I love that little clip. So I yeah, think I to say those would be my favorite. You know, those, those, those are amazing. And interestingly, I mean, maybe if you hadn't been, hadn't spent so much time out in the bush, you'd have picked um, the leopard hunting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there was a lion hunt as well. I mean, there were quite yeah. a few hunts that were picked up on the cameras. But I think for, for those of us who've spent so much time out, it is things like that porcupine. I mean, how many times do guests ask, well, how do porcupines mate? <laughs> and of course, you, I used to tell the story regularly of the fact that apparently porcupines need to mate every day in order for the female to, to, to cycle. And how bizarre it would be that nature should uh, give the animal, one of the only animals that has to mate every day, these incredible hindrances to apparently comfortable copulation. And <laughs> like you say, there we saw it. And it didn't look particularly comfortable, I must nope. say. Uh, it didn't make me feel any easier. I didn't have a moment where I thought, oh, so that's how they do it. My initial reaction was to do that. Uh, and yeah, so exactly you know, right. things have to do it every day. And it's moments like that that are just simply plain odd and unusual. I think that those cameras capture and teach us about, you know, they're massive learning experiences to see things like that because you read about them, but you seldom see them. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, well, awesome, awesome insights. And um, yeah, hopefully we get some more of those incredible things next year. I know we will, you know, we, we, we have expanded into all kinds of different areas this year, Comfers Dam uh, being one of them. You know, another thing at Comfers Dam that we saw, of course, was some really great art fox sightings, which is not something you get to enjoy or watch the behavior of a partic that particular species um, in the field. So 
that was also pretty great. So yeah, man, looking forward to some really cool cameras coming through next year. And um, yeah, who knows what, what the wild might bring for us. But uh, James, that's all we have time for today, mate. And thank you so much for chatting with us. Always a pleasure chatting with you. I hope you have a good break and a nice little holiday and come back refreshed next year. Yes, likewise. And let's hope it come, we come back to a world that is slightly easier to move around in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here on African for Good, brought to you by explore.org. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, if you want to hear about the latest videos that might be coming through uh, in the next few weeks. And of course, we will be back again uh, next year with a, a whole bunch of new videos. We've got a few coming out um, before the end of the year. But from all of us here in the AfriCam team, have a wonderful festive season. I hope you all get a decent break in. We'll see you again soon. Cheers for now.